Our gospel reading comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 3. Glory to you, O Lord. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. And Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, You must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, to you O Christ. Christ. You may be seated. Brothers and sisters, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It's been quite a week. It's been a week marked by grief, by shock, by anger, by sadness. It's been a week of darkness and confusion. But it hasn't only been that, it's been a week of love. It's been a week of community, a week of comfort and forgiveness. It's been a week of crying, but also of laughing. It's been a week of despair, but also hope. It's been a week of wonderful highs, but devastating lows. It's been a week that calls everything into question, a week that leads us to reevaluate our priorities, to reconsider what matters. It's been one of those weeks that drives home the lesson of Ash Wednesday, that we are dust, and to dust we shall return. And it drives that home in a way little else can. And yet in the midst of the extraordinary events of this week, ordinary life has kept going. The very ordinary events of our lives, well, they keep happening. Children keep going to class. They keep playing at recess. People keep driving to work or to the grocery store or to wherever else it is that they would normally go. The sun keeps coming up. The wind keeps blowing. Ordinary life keeps marching on, seemingly oblivious to the way in which our lives have been changed, irreversibly changed. And they have changed. The loss of Michael, the loss of one of our young people, is one of those things that we will carry with us for the rest of our lives. Things are different now. The world has changed. An ordinary life keeps going on, but it's different. It looks different. The things which seemed so important a week ago have faded into the background. The things which we took for granted a week ago, well, we can't take them for granted anymore. We see how important those things are, how important those relationships are, how important those everyday interactions with our own children, our own parents, our own family members are. Now, I don't want to overstate this because this has affected all of us in different ways. For some of us, there is no return to ordinary life. For some of us, this absence, the person who should have been here who isn't here anymore, that will always be with us in everyday interactions, every interaction that we have. Others of us are less directly affected. We grieve, of course, 
but we still have an ordinary that is different, but it's not entirely different in quite the same way. And then others of us, of course, mourn other losses that are fresh and are brought back up by events such as this. And so we mourn those losses as well. There's no one-size-fits-all to a thing like this. But when an event like this hits a community, when a community loses one of its young people, things change. The things which seem so certain suddenly seem less certain. They seem up for grabs. The things which we always knew seem like they could change at any moment. Things seem far less stable than they did a week ago. And I wonder if something like this is happening for Nicodemus in our gospel reading today. We don't know much about Nicodemus. We're told that he's a Pharisee. We're told that he's a leader of the Jews. And if he's a Pharisee, then he's a member of a group who takes following the law very seriously. There's somebody who takes Scripture very seriously. And he's also a leader of the Jews. That means he's earned the respect of people who don't give that respect lightly. He's a successful man, and yet he's coming to Jesus by night. He's coming to Jesus full of questions. He's coming to Jesus not with an entourage, but alone, secretly, it seems. He's coming to Jesus with questions that he doesn't even seem to have the words for. He doesn't even know how to ask these questions. Maybe he doesn't know why he's coming to Jesus, but here he is. And when he gets to Jesus, he speaks to him, and he never quite really gets around to saying anything, asking anything. He says, well, we know, Jesus, you're from God, because no one can do the things you do unless they're from God. And he sort of trails off, and you can almost hear him say, but, but you don't act the way we think that you should act if you're from God. If you're from God, then the way you're acting seems to call what I believe about God into question. The whole things I built my life on, the place that I've dedicated my life in getting to, well, the meaning of it has been called into question if you are from God. And Jesus responds and answers the question that Nicodemus never quite gets around to asking, actually. Jesus says to him, truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above, or you could also read that, born again. No one can see the kingdom of heaven without being born again, born from above. And Nicodemus' response to that, you can hear the note of disappointment, the note of despair, as well as the note of disbelief in it. He says, well, how can this be? Certainly a man growing old, you can tell he's thinking of himself, can't enter into his mother's womb a second time and be born, can he? How could this be? You see, Nicodemus is interested in the kingdom of God. Jesus, I think, hit the nail on the head when he responded to Nicodemus. That is what he's asking about, even if he doesn't have the words for it. But the way that Jesus talks about it seems to take it out of Nicodemus' reach. He hasn't been born twice. He hasn't been born from above. He was born just as anybody else has been born. So Jesus responds to him and answers his how. He says, truly, I tell you, No one can enter the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, without being born of water and spirit. He says, what is born of the flesh is flesh. What is born of the spirit is spirit. Then he says this, the wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes, and so it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. The wind blows where it chooses. That word wind is actually the same word for spirit. The original languages in the Bible use the same word for both. So you could read that the spirit blows where it chooses. And actually that word blows comes from the same word for spirit. The spirit spirits where it chooses, you could say. The spirit does whatever the spirit does, and it does that where it chooses. The spirit's in control of that. And this seems to take it even more out of Nicodemus's reach. He hasn't been born twice. He hasn't been born from above. He doesn't have any idea what it means to be born of water and spirit, especially if the spirit, well, it's spirits where it chooses to go. 
He doesn't seem to have any sort of control over it. And so Nicodemus says the last thing we hear from him in the story, how can these things be? How can these things be? Nicodemus comes up later in the gospel, and he seems to get some of the answers he's looking for, but at this point, Jesus' answers, they don't help him. Jesus' answers don't do much for him at this point. But I wonder if they might help us. Jesus sees this man coming who's had the rug pulled out from under him. Jesus sees this person coming who has no foundation, no sense of up or down, right or left. Everything's upside down and sideways. And he responds to him by talking about being born again from above through water and spirit. He begins, he answers him by talking to him about baptism. And Nicodemus doesn't really know what to do about that, but maybe, maybe we do. We just witnessed a baptism. We just witnessed Abigail Jean Hansen, two months old, be brought forward by her parents and sponsors. We saw some water be poured on her head and some words spoken over her. And maybe it didn't look like much. Maybe it looked like we were just giving her a bath and not even a very thorough one at that. And yet we believe that in that action, everything Jesus talked about in this passage was happening that she was being born a second time from above, that she was being born of water and spirit, that that spirit which spirits where it chooses, well, it chose her today. And it descended on her just as the spirit descended on Jesus at his baptism. And God claimed her as his daughter just as God claimed Jesus as his son at Jesus' baptism. She received a promise, a promise not just from me or from you, but from God, a promise of life, of salvation and forgiveness. And she has no idea, no comprehension of what that promise is, promise is right now. She's too young for that yet. But as she grows up, she'll be told about this day. She'll be told about those promises she received. And maybe she'll learn to trust those promises. And when hard times come to her, when storms come to her, she'll have a foundation on which to stand. She'll know that if everything else seems wrong, if everything else seems upside down and sideways, at least she has God's promise. God's promise which depends not on her, not on me, not on any of you, but on God's unfailing word. God's word that does what it says. God's word that will not come back without doing what it sets out to accomplish. That promise is sure for her. And the more she trusts that, the more she believes that, the more firmly she'll be able to stand and weather the hard times. The more firmly she'll be able to stand in times of confusion, in times where it's hard to know what's right, what's up, what's down. And as it is with her, so it is with all of us who are baptized. For in our baptisms, we received a promise from God, a promise of life, a promise of salvation, a promise of life eternal. And if there's any of you out there listening who have not been baptized and desire to be baptized, well, if you haven't already done so, I hope that you come and talk to Pastor Kendall or me or somebody so that you too can receive that promise. Because it's not just an event that happens to you, it is an event. But it's not just an event that happens to you and then you check it off your list and you go about your business. It's a gift. It's something given to you. It's something for you to use, something for you to carry with you, something for you to shield yourself behind when there seems nothing else strong enough to do that. Your baptism is a promise. And if you trust in that promise, you cannot be shaken no matter what comes to you, for you're protected by God and His Word, for He has made you His own. He has chosen you. The Spirit has chosen you. And so for all of you, as you go back into your ordinary lives, ordinary lives that have been changed, that have been turned upside down and sideways, ordinary lives that are different now and won't ever be the same, may you cling to that promise the promise that's given to you in your baptism. 
May you trust fully in that promise and therefore trust fully in the one who gave it to you. And may you be firmly grounded in your identity as God's child, the one in whom he is well pleased. And thus may you weather every storm relying on the foundation of the God who has chosen you and made you his own. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the wonderful gift of baptism. We pray that you would remind us of our baptisms again and again, that whenever we see water, drive over water, take a shower, wash our face, have a drink of water, you would remind us that, that is how your promise came to us. That is how you made us your own. That is how you made us born anew from above. In this time of darkness and confusion, sustain your light within us. Sustain faith within your, with, sustain the faith in your promise in us. If our faith fails, send others to us that their faith may cover our lack that they may share their faith with us. And above all, send the peace which passes all understanding, that way we may endure this trying time and come out on the other side to see you in life eternal.